There's about 25 billion barrels of oil to be discovered in the Arctic region. But the native people fear losing their culture to oil. Oil ain't everything. What about the human beings that live up here? And with unsettled international boundaries, there's the threat of confrontation. There's always a risk of conflict, especially where you do not have established, delineated, agreed upon borders. We've been to the front line of these changes, to Alaska, to report on a new cold rush. Our first glimpse of what the Arctic is most famous for. This is one of the great sights of the natural world. But it's the peak of the melt season. The ice has vanished, which can mean that polar bears struggle to find anything to eat. This one comes ashore to see what it can get. Everything about the Arctic faces upheaval. The wildlife here happens to be in the region that's the fastest warming anywhere on the planet. And this is on a scale that few expected. It's pretty desolate here and windswept. This is the northernmost shore of the United States. The North Pole is just 1,300 miles behind me. This is Point Barrow, named after John Barrow, the Royal Navy official in the 19th century who sent countless expeditions into the Arctic to try to find the fabled Northwest Passage. Well, he wouldn't believe how the Arctic is changing right now. Normally in the summer, the ice retreats to within about 50 miles of this coast. Well, right now, the ice is 300 miles away. Satellite pictures reveal what's happening. The ice cap shrinks every summer, but now far beyond the average. Most of it is floating, a mass of ice that's now retreating and getting thinner, so it's disintegrating more easily. This matters because white ice reflects sunlight, but the darker ocean absorbs it, so the warming accelerates. This is a catastrophic retreat far faster and quicker and more uh, extensive than what the models predicted. 2007 and 2008 are the two lowest years of summer retreat of ice ever, two greatest retreats of ice, and uh, I think we've got a trend here that's very, very concerning. Out on the tundra, this lonely outpost at Barrow is America's northernmost climate laboratory. A snowy owl appears, a regular of this distant landscape. Here the instruments have been measuring the Arctic's changes, the rise in the greenhouse gas, carbon dioxide, and the retreat of the ice. The chief scientist shows me round. What we're looking at here is our main tower for air inlets where we take our samples and pump them from this tower into the station for analysis. Now, I want to take a look inside in a second, but just before we go in out of the cold, what kind of hazards have you faced up here? We've seen polar bears out here and have had to leave because it's better to just let the polar bears be, let them, let them take their course on through and come back later. So you've got to keep a close watch all the time? Yes. Let's get inside. So Dan, this is where those air samples are pumped into, is it? This is the main room where the analysis happens. The first thing that happens is the, the sample comes in from outside and goes through a chiller that takes all the water vapor out. Water vapors are a real problem for what we're trying to, to analyze. And once it's gone through the dryer, it goes back through the various tubes to the analyzers where we measure for CO, methane, and CO2. So what sort of results do you end up with at the end then? Well, what we see is that the carbon can vary over a short period of time. This is the actual data right here on the screen. Um, that's carbon dioxide day by day. That's carbon dioxide, yes. And overall, what kind of trends are you seeing? What we're seeing, we can show you here, is an increase 
over the last 35 years. I mean, that's incredibly clear. In CO2, there's no doubt that it's increasing. We know that these data are accurate. We have several different comparison methods we use to, to make sure that the data is the highest quality we can have. Now, you've been here 25 years in Barrow. What sort of changes have you seen in the landscape? Um, I've seen a lot of plant change. Uh, we, I've seen frost heaves grow a little bit here. Uh, of course, the milder winters, that sort of thing. And we also see a change in the ice cover. I mean, that's an extraordinary retreat of ice there. Right. What, we, what we're looking at here is the, the blue and the green are areas of thin ice. The white is a little bit thicker. Barrow is, of course, at the top of the screen here. And we're seeing a melt back farther than, than what we have seen in the last 20 years. So to what extent are you convinced something pretty big is going on here? All I have to do is look at this sort of thing and, and you know something is going on. You know, people can argue about what or why, that sort of thing, but nobody can argue that this is not happening. One very big change, it's suddenly easier to get at the Arctic's oil and gas. This is Prudhoe Bay, America's biggest oil field. There are miles of pipeline. The installations along this shore first got going in the 60s. More recently, there's been a push offshore. Instead of oil rigs, the industry here builds entirely new islands, miles out in the sea. But it has plans to do far more of this, with a new wave of projects out in the ocean and along the coast. The Arctic is sitting on a treasure trove of fossil fuel, possibly 25 billion barrels. This is just one of many pipelines crossing this vast landscape. Beneath the grasses lie reserves believed to be among the world's largest. We head inland. To European eyes, this terrain is unimaginably large. It's called the North Slope of Alaska. In fact, it's incredibly flat and seems endless. Well, ahead of us, the incredible sight of what looks like an Arctic fox just scampering away into the distance there. Beautiful, bushy tail there. And it's amazing when you see the tundra, you think, well, nothing can really live here. And then there's this great animal obviously doing fine. really striking about Alaska is its sheer size. I mean, take this pipeline that's running beside this road for mile after mile, and it's just one of the shortest ones they've got here. It simply carries gas from the gas field into the town of Barrow. And of course, across the rest of Alaska, there are pipelines that run for literally thousands of miles. And the thinking is that there are such huge reserves of oil and of gas beneath Alaska and off its shores that some argue that it's crazy not to get at it. This drill, baby drill, they chanted at the Republican Party convention. Alaska's governor, Sarah Palin, candidate for vice president, called for her state's resources to be opened up. Americans, we need to produce more of our own oil and gas. And Take it from a gal who knows the North Slope of Alaska. We've got lots of both. It's a message the oil companies believe is becoming far more popular. I think the American people are on our side. And I think, you know, what's been the real tipping point has been the $4 in the U.S. A $4 gallon has really, really created a, a whole sea change of, uh, of thought on this. And, and folks have recognized that we've gone to a point now where we're importing 60% of our oil. And that's, and, and, and that's really untenable, and people recognize it's going to only get worse. So, yeah, we're kind of in a now or never state with respect to developing outer continental shelf or offshore developments. And, and there, is, there is much more support than there was three years ago. So what about the risks? The nightmare scenario would be an oil spill in the pristine waters of the Arctic. 
Shell sent us these pictures of a clean-up exercise. Shell executives say they're confident they have the latest technology to cope. But environmental scientists are worried about the dangers. I think it's far too risky to do these oil developments offshore in the Chukchi and Beaufort Seas off of Alaska. The oil industry says they can do it safely. There have been several major blowouts offshore in offshore rigs throughout the world that have exceeded the size of the Exxon Valdez oil spill. And also, quite frankly, the industry said before the Exxon Valdez 20 years ago, they said, don't worry, relax, we've got this under control, we can do this, we're not going to have a major oil spill. If it happens, we're going to be able to get it and clean it up. That obviously was wishful thinking. So 20 years on, memories of this spill still haunt this debate. 